Amen. Good morning. It's uh, it works. It works. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. Not everyone is here today. I think uh, seems seems like the holiday has begun. Yeah. <clears throat> Some people have uh, joined the Causeway queue. <laughs> In the next three hours, they will be uh, having fun. All right. Okay, today's uh, lesson is called Getting to Know You, Who is the Holy Spirit, all right? This is a picture of me on the left, getting baptized on May 16, 1988. <clears throat> Long time ago. I didn't even know this picture exists, but uh, existed, um, but only after I came back from the U.S. 1993, uh, then I went to my dad's house and, uh, and I found among a lot of photos that's piled uh, in a cupboard. Uh, this photo, which apparently someone took of me, gave it to me, and then I mailed it to my dad in 1988. Then, uh, then I came back to Singapore, then I realized, hey, uh, I forgot there was this. So I quickly scanned it, and uh, every, every um, year on May 16, I will text the brother, I will send, uh, text the brother who baptized me this picture, hey, remember you baptized me, you know. <clears throat> so about uh, two, three years ago, he came to Singapore on a business trip, and that's him on the right there. <coughs> His name is Jim Hess. And uh, we, he, he stayed in a hotel in Novena. So we hung out. Uh, he, has, he has this uh, a Marriott uh, membership there. So he gets to stay in nice rooms. Um, so now, like most of you, when, when I got baptized, uh, I was read the passage from Matthew 28 that says, Because of your good confession, I will now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your sins will be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? So, for the next 20 years, 28 years after that, I grew in my knowledge of God and I grew in my knowledge of Jesus. But I never paid much attention to the Holy Spirit. Then in 2016, I went to Bali for a conference, uh, and a, a Christian conference. I was spending time with a brother who led the church in Chengdu, and we had a great time, but he was commenting to me that the night before, there was an outdoor banquet on the beach, and heavy rain came, and everybody had to run for cover and just find some place to hide. There was no contingency plan. And then he told me that he talked to the Indonesian staff. How come there was no contingency plan? If this were run by the staff in Hong Kong, it would never happen. Everything would be planned down with contingency plan A, B, and C. That's how the Chinese would do it, yeah? But the Indonesian says, in Indonesia, we just go by the spirit. Uh, too bad Hiro and Misa are not here. Huh? They would they would understand. I don't know why, but this sparked a curiosity in me. And I, uh, when, when, when I came back to Singapore, I did a deep dive, my first deep dive Bible study into the Holy Spirit. I spent a few weeks studying it and uh, even came up with a quiet time series. And it was very life-changing for me. Can you imagine having someone in your life for 28 years, and then someone asks you, can you tell me something about this person? You have nothing to say. How much can you share if someone asks you, can you tell me more about the Holy Spirit? So one of the biggest problems with our tradition, and, and maybe a lot of other Christian uh, traditions, is that we have ignored the Holy Spirit almost entirely. So I think it's about time we try to correct this mistake a little bit. Yeah. So today, we will start on a short series on the Holy Spirit. So I will talk about who is the Holy Spirit. Next week, Wee Kyung will touch on the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Then uh, on the third week, Yen Fen will talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And after that, I would like to make a little detour. And um, in the spirit of learning more about God, talk a little bit about idolatry and the false 
images of God that we have. Okay? The false ideas about God. Now, as I prepared this lesson myself, um, I realized that even in three, four weeks, we will actually only touch on the surface of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's just so much about God's Spirit to learn. And um, so today I would like to share with you some of the ways I think about the Spirit. I, I no longer dare to tell you this is it. This is the right understanding. This is the right interpretation. I find that I'm constantly learning, constantly growing. So I can only share with you what I now understand and think about the Holy Spirit. Okay? If you can accept that. So this is only going to be a bit like a Bible lesson. Uh, and I have a lot of scriptures, and I'll fly through them, so bear with me, okay? And I'll give you some uh, uh, things to think about. So where do we begin? We begin in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1. Now, in the Jewish tradition, there is no concept of Trinity, but there's, they've always been aware of the Spirit of God, and we meet Him right here in the beginning of the Bible. Okay, so let us read. When God began to create the heavens and the earth... You, you notice the wording is a bit different. I'm taking it from the New Revised Standard Version. Yeah? When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, in the NRSV, this version, the word used here to introduce the Spirit of God, that introduced the Spirit of God, is wind, or in Hebrew, ruach. Ruach literally means wind or breath. And this word ruach is used throughout the Bible to describe God's Spirit. And in other versions, uh, in different places, the, this word ruach is often translated as spirit. Okay? So incidentally, and this is why in John chapter 3, when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born of the Spirit, and then he goes on to say, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it is coming from and where it is going, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I always thought, why he talk about you must be born of the Spirit, then talk about wind. Then now I realize, actually to them, it's the same word. And they understand. The, the word wind or breath has always been equated with the Spirit of God. You can't see it, but you know what it can do, in other words. So here in Genesis, it says, the wind of God swept over the first face of the earth, and then what happens? God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the first thing we come to know is that the Spirit of God is often depicted as the power or the enabler of God in the Bible. The Spirit of God is where the power of God resides. Now, the phrasing might not be right. A theologian may say my you know, sentence is wrong, but you get the idea. Yeah? The Spirit is where the power of God resides. He's the enabler of God. In Genesis 41, we find that um, Joseph was able to interpret dreams and he was full of wisdom, so much so that the Pharaoh was convinced that he had the Spirit of God and he made him Prime Minister. If you run the country, we'll be fine. His wisdom and ability to interpret dreams, was, we, we learn from the Bible, is from the Holy Spirit. You see him being the enabler, all right? In Exodus chapter 31, I won't read this. I'm going to just tell you the story. Yeah? We meet a man called Bazalel, whom the Bible says because he was filled with the Spirit of God, he was able not to do miracles or spiritual things, but to do artistic things. And with his, uh, his, uh, his craftsmanship, his artism, he built the Ark of the Covenant and made it incredibly beautiful. Full, you know, covered with gold and everything. Bazalel was a skillful, knowledgeable, and intelligent artist because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, many of us here are skilled and in many different things. Okay? Surely in art. Yeah? 
Daniel, where are you? Daniel in music. He, yeah, he can play without music score. Everything keep in his head. You want to play this song? Okay, I play. You play that song? Okay, I play. Yeah? Uh, Grace, Grace is not here. Grace in music also. My brother, music also. Yeah, Natalie, incredibly talented. All right? Uh, that Sarah, Laura, all good in art. What else? Mike, oh, incredible singing voice. Jin Kai can write poetry. And I'm sure there are a lot of you have different artistic talent as well, yeah? And I believe that all talent comes from God's Spirit. It applies to Christians and non-Christians. And if you read Genesis carefully and you like to watch nature documentaries or you like to travel around the world to see beautiful nature sites, you should already by now come to the conclusion that God is incredibly, incredibly creative. Just animals alone. From incredibly ugly animals to incredibly cute animals, you can sense the range of His creativity. And most of His art actually is not for you and I. It's hidden from us. We have to go discover it. It's for Him. And it's all enabled by His Spirit. And His Spirit gives us also the same power of creativity. In Exodus 11, the Lord told Moses to gather up the elders of Israel to share His load of leadership. And God said, now He will give the elders some of the Spirit that is already in Moses. And that's enough. Give them, and become, uh, give them the ability to lead God's people. Leadership is also a talent. Good leadership is, at least, all right? Some people think they are good leaders, but they are deceived. But good leadership comes from God because His Spirit enables them, empowers them. Most of the time, good leadership demands wisdom. Good leadership actually demands humility. Good leadership demands servanthood. And these are qualities of God. And, it's, and a man is enabled to have the power to do these things because of the Spirit of God. That's amazing. For example, in Deuteronomy 34 verse 9, we find that Joshua was not only a bold and brave leader, he was full of wisdom too. And here, God's Spirit is literally called the Spirit of Wisdom, Ruach. So throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit has been the enabler, the source of strength and uh, source of ability for all the leaders in, in, in the history of Israel, the judges, the kings, and the prophets, all right? And we will not go into all the examples, but you can, you can, if you read the Bible, you will find them everywhere. He is the enabler of all the leaders. When he was with Saul, he was a great leader. When he left Saul, he went crazy. Yeah? The evil spirit went into his heart. Then, in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, that was also because of God's spirit. Now, in the New Testament, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Yes, okay, the different word now. But the, the meaning of the word pneuma is still the same. Wind or breath. And the fact that Jesus could incarnate, become cells, little baby in the womb, was because of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Spirit came through that. In Romans, Paul tells us that it is the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And that the Spirit dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. Jesus' incarnation, becoming human, was brought about by the Spirit, but so was His resurrection. 
after he died, he, he could, how, how could that be possible? It was the Spirit that gave him the power to lift him, him up. And Paul starts to make the connection that that Spirit also will give us life. Okay? I'm going very quickly. And then we go back to Ezekiel 36. In Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel was prophesying about the day when Jesus would come, about Pentecost. And Jesus said this, For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands, and I will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit, Ruach, within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and bring it about that you walk in my statutes and are careful to follow my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. He says here that one day to the Israelites, so one day his spirit will empower us to have a change of heart so that we will be able to follow God's words. Do you realize that every single repentance you have made, every softening of your heart that has happened, every change that has taken place was because of God's Spirit in you. He prompted you and gave you strength and, and, and um, the, the will to m make a repentance to change. And uh, incidentally, this is a kind of a side point, when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you need to be born again of water and of spirit, he actually was not talking about baptism, dunking and coming out. He was actually referring to this passage. Because he's saying, aren't you the teacher, the law, teacher of the law? You should know this. He's saying, telling Nicodemus, Demas, you should know this. God already prophesied, I will cleanse you with water and with my spirit. And then you will have a new heart. And again, later on in uh, chapter 37, Ezekiel goes on to say, uh, the, the Bible actually tells us that even though if we are spiritually like dry bones, the Spirit can revive us. If we feel like we are spiritually dead, no fear. God's Spirit will revive you and me with His breath. All right? Let's read this one. Again, He said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, you dry bones, hear the word of God. This is what the Lord God says to these bone, bones. Behold, I'm going to make breath enter you so that you may come to life. And I will attach tendons to you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you so that you may come to life, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I, com I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a loud noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together. This is look, think of the special effects. Huh? Um, bones came together, bone to bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, tendons were on them. Flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, the Lord God says this, come from the four winds, breath, breathe, and, the breath, and breathe on these slain so that they can come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So my first point is this. God's Spirit is the enabler, is His enabler. The power of God that created and sustains the universe. Gave us Jesus and raised Him from the dead. The power that changed us thus far and will continue to change us. And that power resides in you and me who was baptized into Christ. Okay? Point number one. Then I give you a couple of things to think about. Why would God let His presence and His power reside with you 
a power that created this universe that embodies his creativity and his wisdom, a power that sustains this universe that incarnated Jesus, resurrected Jesus, that can give life to dry bones, why would God let his spirit be with you and I? And what would life be if you and I actually could tap into this power in our lives? Okay, I'm just you, going to give you a few seconds to just ponder about this for a while. You don't have to write down any thoughts, okay? If thoughts come to you, you can write it down. If nothing comes to you, never mind. Just think about it for a few seconds. Okay, let us continue. I think you can take a couple of weeks to think about this, yeah? <laughs> okay, let's continue. And we'll move on to point two, yeah? Now, the Gospel of John is probably the best book, uh, the book that talks most about the Holy Spirit. And usually it's Jesus himself who talks about the Spirit. So let's read this together, right? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own, but he will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you, all that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. There are a lot of things to unpack here, and we'll come back to this passage quite a few times. But here we notice that Jesus always refers to the Holy Spirit as he, never it. But the Holy Spirit is a he. Does that. By that, I don't mean he's male. I mean he is a person. I know many of us maybe knows this, okay? But in our daily interactions, when we say things like, oh, I trust in the Spirit or let the Spirit lead, do we really think of the Spirit as an it or a him? What is the difference, you ask? What is the implication of knowing the Holy Spirit as a person and as opposed to an entity, okay? Maybe an arm of God, an agent of God, right? Well, let's see. In Ephesians 4, uh, Paul writes, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. But be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. The first thing we learn here is that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. If you check the dictionary of what grief means, that it's not the definitions, definitions are usually not very thorough, but the two words that stand out is sorrow and distress. When you are grieving, you feel sorrow and distress, maybe anger as well. Yeah? How do we make him feel sorrow and distress. According to this passage, it means when we are bitter and angry and wrathful and full of malice, notice that these are things that we do to other people. In Isaiah, we read, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit and therefore he became their enemy. He himself fought against them. We read that we also grieve him when we rebel against God. And when God's people grieve him, he can even become their enemy and fight against them. That's scary, yeah? That's what happens when you grieve him. So he can be grieved, but he can also feel joy, that means. How do we make him feel joy? In Ephesians, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. 
So why do we think that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Because these are His qualities. And when we capture His qualities, it brings Him joy. So the Holy Spirit is emotional, just as God is emotional. And you and I can break His heart. Or you and I can make Him sing with joy. So to, to know God's Spirit as a person, it is like knowing anyone else as a person. We need to care about His feelings. In other words, if you love God, don't grieve Him. We, th- we tend to think that we will anger Him when we sin. We will disappoint Him when we sin. Seldom do we think we will break His heart when, he's, when we sin. Seldom do we think we will grieve Him when we sin. So, it's all about treating Him as someone who loves you and also whom you love and care about. In Romans 8, Paul tells us that the Spirit of God has His own mind. And God knows His mind intimately. God knows the Spirit's mind intimately. And because the Spirit knows our mind, through the Spirit, God God will know what is in our hearts, even when we cannot find any words for it. Very often, you go to God, you know, sometimes I go and pray and and you think about, what do I want to pray? I have no idea. I feel a lot of things. I don't know what to say. But the Spirit knows. And through the Spirit, because God knows the Spirit's mind, God will know as well. So sometimes now I pray, God, what's on my mind? You tell me, lah. You know? Make it clear to me. I can't fi- seem to figure it out. Make it clear to me. The Spirit of God feels joy, grieves, and has His own mind. How does this change the way we relate to Him? Do you perhaps feel that there is a level of intimacy that should have been there but has been missing? Yeah? How should this change the way I pray? You know? Do you know that when we pray, your Bible says somewhere else, you have to pray in the Spirit, right? How does this change the way we pray? So my point number two is, the Holy Spirit has personhood. He is the presence of God in our lives, and He has a mind. He can grieve. Um, sorry, typo. Uh, we must not relate to Him as an entity, but as a person. So I think the mistakes a lot of us often make is because the Bible calls Him Spirit. We think of Him as some kind of agent of God instead of He is God. Right? Just like in, in John, he says, Jesus was with God in the beginning. He was with God, but he was God. So you could apply that to, to the Spirit as well. He is with God and he is God. You know? He is the presence of God in our lives. He has a mind, he has can grief, and we have to relate to him as a person. So, another two questions to ponder. Yeah? Do I usually see the Holy Spirit as impersonal or personal? And what difference would it really make for me? Uh, The way I think about this is I think about some people in my life and do I treat them impersonally or personally? You know? Uh, For example, at work, sometimes your colleagues, you can treat them impersonally. Yeah? Not as a real person, as just someone you work with, so to speak. What difference does it make? Okay? So what does it, how, how does that correlate to how we relate to the Holy Spirit? How would this change my prayer life if the Spirit of God resides with me and is a person? All right? Okay. Next. This is actually the same passage. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I don't go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin. Jesus tells us that the Spirit of God is the one that convicts us of sin. He is actually the source of our conscience, or you could say he is our conscience. 
it is not actually, apparently, not our intellect that tells us we are wrong. Our conscience is the Spirit of God poking us and telling us, hey, what you said just now was really nasty. What you did was terrible. You are being incredibly selfish. You are prideful, huh? You won't admit you are wrong, huh? You were unkind. And you are a bully. Now, whether you will listen to this voice is up to you. Up to you, up to us, of course. But the Bible does say that for some people, their conscience have been seared. That means burnt and hardened. No more feelings. But if the, whole, the Spirit of God is your conscience, then what do we do? Do we listen or do we ignore? Oops. Okay, there. So, point three is, whoops, sorry. Point three is the Spirit of God is our conscience as well. And one point to ponder if the Spirit is your conscience, do we love our conscience or do we hate our conscience? Most of the time, we hate our conscience. Just don't bother me, don't bug me, <laughs> go away. Right? But if the, your conscience is the Holy Spirit who loves you, then when your conscience pokes you, that's you say, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for reminding me. Thank you for telling me what I don't want to hear. Next, point four. And it's kind of the same passage as well. Um, let's read. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak of His own, but will speak whatever He hears. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, and for this reason I said that He will take what is mine and declare it to you. I just want you to focus on the part in red. He will not speak on his own, but only speak whatever he hears from me, Jesus, and from my Father. Here Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit, I, I would use the word reticent. He doesn't want to say whatever is on his mind. Okay? He always seems to work behind the scene. And he's content to, to defer to Jesus, meaning to point your attention to Jesus. And one could argue that this is actually similar to the father and the son. The father says, look at my son. He is so awesome. Listen to him. Right? And father, the father says, oh, who will judge? My son will judge. The word will judge. So, I, you know, so the father kind of defers to the son. And the son also defers to the Holy Spirit. The son says, you can blaspheme against me, the son of man, but if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, oh, there's no forgiveness for that. The son actually lifts up the Holy Spirit even higher. You, you notice that, that, that the relationship within the father, son, and Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit himself defers to the Son and wants, wants you and I to pay attention to the Son. There is even a, even a book written called The Holy Spirit, the shy member of the Holy Spirit, uh, the shy member of the Trinity. He's the shy one. Yeah. Similar ideas all over the book of John. Here it says, um, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said. See, he's talking, Holy Spirit will, will remind you of what Jesus has said. And he, in, in 15, chapter 15, he says, When the Advocate comes, and I will send to, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. So, the New Testament was actually written many years 
after Jesus died and resurrected. When it was time to write down everything, because they were busy, you know, growing the church, teaching the church. And at some point, someone says, we need to write this down. Maybe it was Mark. Maybe it was Peter, right? And um, the re- apostles then will have to recollect. They start doing interviews, especially with people like Luke. How to remember everything, right? Bible tells us the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything. And they, re- they remembered so many things that John says, if I kept on writing, all the books in the world will not be able to cover. So I only r- write 21 chapters, so to speak. Yeah? So the Holy Spirit enabled the, uh, the apostles to remember all these things and everything was written referred to Jesus. Oops, sorry. Go back, go back, go back. Okay. In Isaiah, we also read about this, this very shy nature of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. This passage, God is talking about Jesus as his servant. And the servant will, be, will have God's spirit. And because he has God's spirit, he will not cry out or lift up his voice or, so that he will be heard. But instead, he will be gentle. If you were bruised, he will treat you with gentleness. He will not break you off. I find that very encouraging. All right? So the man who is full of the Holy Spirit will also be like this. Gentle, quiet, and faithful. Now, I think that is why we all don't know much about the Spirit in our Christian life. He doesn't like to draw attention to himself. He likes to stay in the background. Okay? Someone once says, do you think you can tell who is humble? If you notice him, then he's not humble. The humble one is the one you don't notice. Well, I thought, wow, like that, how? Ah? I try to be humble, leh, but no one will notice. Leh. <laughs> you know? The Holy Spirit doesn't like to draw attention to himself. He is content that we focus on Jesus. And yet, if he is in us, I thought, shouldn't we try to know him better so that we can become a bit more like him? Okay? So the Holy Spirit is reticent. The word reticent I like, it means intent, inclined to be quiet, silent, restrained, or deferential. He's reticent. He's shy and humble. And he will not, and here's the good news, he will not impose himself on you. So he is harder to get to know. And so sometimes when I pray and say, you know, dear Holy Spirit, uh, tell me something, you know, what's going on in my heart. And I hear nothing. <laughs> now I know, okay, that's okay. You know, in time you will talk to me, but right now you are just a quiet one. You know, there are some introverts among us uh, who don't like to talk, right? Hey, don't worry, Holy Spirit also just like you, Okay. <laughs> Two points to ponder. If someone is shy and does not like to draw attention to himself, what do you need to get to know him better? What do you need to do to get to know him better? And if the Spirit always defers to Jesus, how does that change your own spiritual formation? The second one is quite deep. If a, if a spirit, spiritual man is the one who always points you to someone else, how, how, how does that change me? I remember uh, someone was, uh, I think it was Jennifer Chu, who went to US to do a, uh, for a conference or something. He met Sherwin McIntosh. 
And he, she went up to Sherwin McIntosh and said, Oh, you're so awesome. I love your musicals. I love your song, blah, 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 blah. So, oh, you're so awesome. And then Sherwin McIntosh like, uh, Come meet my wife. And he pulled his wife over and got Jennifer to talk to his wife. And then he disappeared. That is like the Holy Spirit. And okay, last point. Point five. Psalm 139. Oh God, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit up and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the furthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. Where can I go? from your spirit. For those of you who have been baptized into Christ, God's Spirit knows you intimately, is with you all the time. He knows what you're going to say even before you say it. He protects you. He leads you. And Psalm 139 is a, is a passage that is very good for you to uh, read and meditate all the time, every two weeks, every four weeks. Part five, uh, point five is that, oops, there we go. Did I? Okay. Point five is the Holy Spirit is our companion, is our constant companion. I think it's about time we learn to listen to the Holy Spirit in our lives and to walk with Him. At the very least, to be aware of His presence in your life. He is God's presence in your life. And I pray that it, as you walk with Him, He will guide you, empower you, change you, uh, comfort you, help you not feel lonely ever, help you feel fellowship, and help you be aware of the presence of God at all times. So, this is just touching the surface of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know more, uh, I can recommend a book uh, to start off with. Uh, Francis Chan wrote a nice book called uh, For The Forgotten God. You can, yeah, that's, that's a good book to start with. All right? And I will later on also uh, send you A Quiet Time, the one I did in 2016. Uh, and I hope that can also uh, be helpful to you. There are actually many, many books on the Holy Spirit. But because of denominational uh, emphasis, not all books are um, helpful. Sometimes they are just too much theology and, and, you know, and, and, and not so personal. But uh, the Francis Chan book is a good place to, to begin. All right? So uh, at this time, uh, let us close off with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much uh, for loving us, so much that uh, you sent your son to die to pay for our sins so that we may be forgiven. And also not only that, that you put your presence in our life in the, through the Holy Spirit who walks with us all the days of our lives. And we pray that you will help us to be more aware of his presence, be more aware of the way he guides us, the, w the way he leads us, and help us to feel close to you through the Spirit, help us to also understand ourselves better, to grow in, our, um, in, in seeing how we, can, we reflect you in, in our lives, and uh, we pray that the fellowship with the Spirit will bring us joy and happiness and, and comfort uh, and, know, and to feel this love uh, at, at all times. We pray that uh, through the Spirit, we can also uh, share this love with other people around us. We thank you for all your blessings. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. One more song? Okay, thank you.